Welcome everybody to our webinar about Ask the Experts About Sunflowers. Um, I'm Diane Blazik with National Garden Bureau. I'm the Executive Director. We have Gail Pabst on the line also. Um, she is behind the scenes, but she's the one who does all of our social media and marketing. So she's the one who's been posting about this webinar and then after the fact, She'll be putting everything out on social media and we'll send out um, an e-newsletter as a follow-up. So we welcome uh, Gail here, our panelist. We have two panelists today. One is Bob Croft from Cicada and our second one is Georgia Clay from Monrovia. And in just a minute, I will turn it over to them and they can introduce themselves more thoroughly, much better than what I could do. Um, first thing from housekeeping, if you can stay on mute, it will definitely help the quality of our webinar today with this number of people on one call. Um, it's better to allow just the moderator and host to be speaking. And also, um, if you can, this is just a little tip, if you put it on speaker view, if you put your Zoom on speaker view, go up to the upper right, that way, whoever is speaking will show up larger on your screen instead of the whole grid. So that's just another thing that uh, we wanted to give you as a little tip. Um, I mentioned that it is the year of the sunflower. And I also wanted to tell everybody about our sunflower video contest. I would really encourage you to enter. This is the URL on our website, ngb.org slash sunflower video contest. Gail will put that in the chat so that you can see um, where that URL link is and click on that. Just uh, do some sort of fun, educational, um, emotional, caring video talking about how much you love sunflowers and then enter the contest using the entry forms and guidelines that you find on this page of our website. And at the end of the summer, at the end of the contest, then we will announce who our winners are. So we had one a couple of years ago when it was the year of the Snapdragon. It was super fun. We have some amazing Snapdragon videos. So we're hoping for the same thing this year with sunflowers. So uh, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna stop sharing my screen because we don't have any kind of a PowerPoint. This is very much um, off the cuff. You guys ask questions and our experts will answer them. We have a few preformed questions, but if you do want to post any additional questions, do so in the chat. I will moderate those and ask them of our panelists, Georgia and Bob. So I think now it's time. Um, I don't know which one of you wants to go first, so you guys can just take turns, but Bob and Georgia, welcome to our webinar. You guys can introduce yourself and then I'll start with my questions. Thanks, so I guess I'll go first. Um, yeah, so like uh, Diane had mentioned, my name is Georgia Clay. I work for Monrovia Nursery. Um, that's a wholesale nursery. We have four nurseries all around the country uh, both all corners of the US um, strictly focus mainly on home gardeners. So bringing wholesale plants to the garden center that directly go to your garden. Um, my role there is new plants manager. Um, and what that basically means is that I'm in charge of helping bring plants from breeders to our trialing center. We have trialings at all of our nurseries that ultimately gets to your garden center. So I just am helping the breeders test and make notes and figure out what kind of plants um, you will ultimately be successful with, um, giving you the confidence to, to keep gardening and to keep pushing your garden a little further. Okay, um, yeah, happy to be here. I work for Cicada Seed America. We're uh, basically a wholesale breeder. We primarily breed cut flowers, sunflowers for the commercial trade. But we also do have some hobby sunflowers like Sundance Kid. And I base primarily I'm a technical support manager. So I uh, work with growers to produce uh, outstanding crops of cut flowers. Um, been with the company almost 30 years. So thank you. Great. Thank you for the introductions. Um, so let's talk about. Um, the different types of sunflowers. I was doing a presentation for a master gardener group a couple months ago and I was going through our whole year of and I was like, 
wow, how do I break these down? So I just started breaking them down by types. And so I think I'll toss it over to you guys for different types, different sizes, and then we'll put you on the spot and ask you what some of your favorite types are. So Georgia, you went first last time. So Bob, why don't you go first this time? Okay, well, the uh, probably the most familiar sunflower is the Helianthus anis. Um, that's the Latin name. Helios comes from the Greek meaning sun and anis means flower. So the Latin name basically means sunflower. Um, but most of you are familiar with the annual ones that are typical in the gardens. There's a whole host of other uh, Helianthus types, uh, native, basically native sunflowers you would find in the prairies. Things like Maximiliani and Grosser serratus. Um, you can all find, if you just go to like prairiemoonnursery.com, you could find all sorts of different uh, native sunflowers. Um, I, I like a lot of the native ones because I think the pollinators are attracted to them also, and they have a different form. And they're also not as easily for squirrels to climb up and eat all the seeds. So. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, yeah, most of the varieties, um, are, are annuous, like Bob had mentioned, um, but there's a million difference and, and some are perennials, there's swamp sunflower, the Western sunflower, all the way down to zones three, um, you can find perennial sunflowers. Um, even Jerusalem artichoke, people eat those tubers, that's a helianthus variety as well. Um, my favorites are, uh, you know, I love the classic, sunflowers to me are, sort of a treat of summer. It's the epitome of that in my mind. So for me, the classic tall towering sunflowers that you see in the backyard along the fence are some of my absolute favorites, like the mammoths that are great for eating and then great sunflowers about a foot across, which are pretty impressive. Um, we also now are seeing, Monrovia just introduced, we have our sun believable sunflowers, which are pretty fantastic as well. So as opposed to those towering sunflowers that you need a lot of space for, um, these are more compact, so more well, better branched. Um, they are no longer one and done. And so I love a plant that's going to produce a lot of blooms throughout the year and that's going to be minimal input. And so something like the sun believable that's a little shorter and that puts on hundreds if not a thousand blooms um, in a season is going to give me that punch of color that I'm looking for whether it's in a container or in any small bed or border. Another thing that I was thinking about too is um, how there's so many different sizes and types of the annual sunflower. So you've got like the mammoth, which is super tall, I guess, maybe over six feet tall or maybe over 10 feet tall. And then you've got kind of those medium height ones. Then you can also get the really compact ones. Now they make uh, potted sunflowers that maybe only get 12 or 18 inches tall. And then like the one you were talking about, Georgia, how it's almost like a shrub. So it gets I don't, three to four feet tall, but it's just super florific instead of just having maybe one sunflower per stalk, like the traditional one that people might think of. Yeah, yeah, and you know, the single stem types are the ones that produce the one flower with the big stalk, and then there's the multi-stem types where you get, so there's all sorts of different things, and now you can have a little fun with it and, and have many different sunflowers filling many different roles in the garden, which is always fun. Yes, excellent. Okay, so let's get down to um, any tips on helping people decide maybe which variety to grow. I mean, um, can you talk about what the in uses might be or where in the garden they might plant? Like how, how would people decide which variety to plant? I can take this one as well. So um, first, I think you need to identify where you'd like them. So identify what your goal is. So are you trying to, you know, for me, I have a fence in the back, but I still like to provide a little bit extra screening up top throughout the summer because we spend a lot of time back there. So for me, I am going to put those mammoths that I love so much against that fence. They grow really quick. They fill in. They have those large umbrellas um, and they provide some extra screening. So that's a, a use that I would choose that. I wouldn't put a dwarf sunflower there. Um, but you know, up in the front, I have my container plants and I have my big by the doorway and I would put something like a dwarf, you know, those smaller, a foot, two foot, three foot plants in that space. 
Um, another one, you know, if you're planting for pollinators, something like lemon queen, the king, the queen of pollinators, sunflowers produces a ton of nectar, a ton of pollen. So it all is, you know, what choose what you want to do, whether it's cut flowers, cut flowers, you're looking probably for a pollenless sunflower because they're a little less messy on the table on your on your uh, clothes as you're cutting them, they're not going to stain. So just think about what your ultimate goal is and you can, you know, quick Google away. You can probably find the best variety that you're looking for. And Bob, anything to add there on trying to decide which sunflower to plant? Well, I think a lot of, oftentimes the large, the mammoth types are wonderful, uh, especially for children, but they do tend to only make one flower and then they kind of hang and droop. So if you're looking for something that it's going to give you color continuously more of the multi-branched smaller flower types there's one called pan p-a-n that's from select seeds that's i've planted it's quite nice it just it keeps flowering all summer has seeds for the birds and um it gets you know gives you color all season long unless you can also do successive sowings of the, the taller ones too if you want to have continuous color that's another option and if you think you'll be growing them specifically to harvest the seeds for yourself, um, other than for the birds that want them, um, there are some specific uh, varieties that have like the larger seeds, which is nicer for human consumption, correct? Right. I think Burpee offers one called um, snacking or something or. Yeah, I think yeah, that it's is the, like name the it. snack mix or. Right. Yeah, there are definitely some that uh, you might have to take an old potato sack and cover the head with it to keep the birds away because they, they seem to start looking for that fairly early. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, okay, and so you had brought up something that was a little bit further down on um, my list of questions, but since you brought it up, it's a good flow. So what about pollenless sunflowers? I think some people are saying that it's not good for the pollinators if it does not have pollen. The fact of the matter is, is it still has nectar. So can you um, two talk about that a little bit? Sure, yeah. So um, I think that there's a balance to be had in a garden. So yes, pollenless sunflowers do not have pollen. Um, that can be great when you're cutting less messy. Um, a lot of those are really quite beautiful, um, but they do still have nectar. So that means that the bees still can enjoy the nectar. The nectar is what they bring back to their hive to make honey with. Um, so that is really important. It's, a, it's an instant burst of energy for the bees. Um, it also still, um, butterflies love sunflowers and so butterflies love the nectar, hummingbirds. So a lot of different pollinators are going to your sunflowers, not just the, the honeybees. So they are still relevant. And I also think, you know, for me, one of the keys to a great pollinator garden is plant diversity. And so, you know, you can, you can choose to have a sunflower for cutting that's pollenless and sterile and it produces a lot of flowers that are beautiful that you can put on your table. And then you can have many other types of flowering plants around that provide that pollen for the bees. Um, but I, I, I don't tend to subscribe to the all or nothing version of, you know, it's either the best you can get for a pollinator or it's bad. Um, I think that there's a balance to be had with that. Um, so pollenless sunflowers to me are not a bad thing. It's just knowing that that's what you have and maybe providing something supplemental next to your sunflowers. Right, and uh, I did a little research. Honey is basically 98% uh, water and uh, sugar, glucose and fructose. And most uh, bees aren't really attracted to pollen because it doesn't taste that great. It's primarily used just to feed the larvae when they first hatch. So they do come for the nectar and they do need some of the pollen you know, in the honey, but it's not the primary um, resource for them. So it's, um, yeah, they, you do see the bees on the pollenist types. Um, and if you do have pollen, like wild pollen flower, or sunflowers with pollen, they will, if you do have some pollenless types and you get across uh, an outcross with some pollen, they're gonna get some seeds, so. 
Okay, good. Um, here's a quick question. What kind of sack do you use to cover the sunflower heads to um, keep them away from the birds? Yeah, Any never... sort of, oh, go ahead, Bob. I was gonna say, I mentioned a potato sack. That's all I can think of because I don't really <laughs> do that much, so. Yeah, um, it just really any, any, like I have these mesh sacks that I use. Um, I have this extra large mesh sack that I used when I buy groceries or when I buy vegetables at the grocery store. So I love those produce uh, bags that are breathable, it's kind of mesh. Um, but they are able to cinch at the bottom, but leave a lot of extra room for the head. Um, so it can keep growing and expanding. So that's something that I use. Um, I've never tried it, but on my squash, I use pantyhose um, because it can, it, it, it fits, it grows with the plant. I've never tried it on a sunflower, but it could be interesting. I don't know, maybe I'll try that next year, but <laughs> I so think anything that's breathable. Yeah, um, somebody else said a five pound onion bag netted, you know, so as long as the holes in the bag um, are not too large, where some of the seeds might fall through, but also it has to be breathable, you can't use anything plastic either. So any of those tips are, are good ones. Um, okay, so I see Andrew um, suggested about the onion bag. So I wanna ask his question and Andrew, forgive me if I mess up the pronunciation of this. He's asking, are sunflower plants allopathic? Uh, yes, the, the toxicity, is that what we're asking about? I think so, yes. Yeah. Um, so yes, they are. So all of the uh, parts of the sunflower are actually toxic. Um, that makes them inhibit the growth of plants in your garden around them generally. Um, and that's mainly, as I know it, Bob, correct me if I'm wrong, it's mainly younger plants, the fast growing annual type plants. Um, but you'll notice that like, um, some the little black seeds and the bird mix, those are sunflower seeds usually. And you'll notice when the birds are feeding on their sunflower seed mix, the grass below it oftentimes is dead. That's because of that toxicity from the sunflower seeds. Um, it's not really a huge deal. Just be careful, do a little research before you plant them next to something um, in your garden like vegetables. Um, you know, cut back, remove them from the garden when they are finished blooming, um, when they've dried down, actually the, the dried stalks of the larger sunflowers are great kindling for fire. So that's a good way to use that material, cut it, and it makes really great fire starter through the winter. Um, but yeah, they are uh, definitely produce some toxins. So it's something to be aware of. Yeah, it's like you said, it's primarily the husk that has the, uh, the chemical in it, so. And we did, um, we had a writer do um, a blog for us and I'm trying to remember which one it is. If we can't find it and put it in chat now, um, we'll send it out after the fact. It was um, about combinations or companion plants for our year of, and she did a really good job of describing this um, in that blog post. So we'll follow up with that at a later date. But yeah, unfortunately she came back to us and said, well, you know, with sunflowers, you just have to be a little bit careful. So that was kind of the message in there. But yeah, they do have that, that, um, what do I want to say? That, that <laughs> factor that uh, I, I don't want to call it a detriment. I would never say that about sunflowers because yeah. <laughs> I love them. Um, okay, so now uh, I was going to talk about planting. Any tips on planting? I noticed somebody asked about soil pH, and Bob already answered that in the thing. Um, so any tips on planting? And literally online, somebody said, does it matter which side of the seed points up? Is it the pointy side up or the rounded side up when you're planting them? Um, yeah, so any tips there on planting? Well, we generally we generally recommend like maybe a quarter inch to a half inch at the most. Um, depends on the size of the seed. You know, bigger seeds are going to need a little, little deeper. The general rule of thumb has always been like twice the thick or once the thickness of the seed, kind of. But it all depends if you can keep the thing watered well, and um, if the soil is sandy, it can go a little deeper. If it's real heavy clay, maybe a little shallower, because it needs that aeration in order to germinate. 
And I think mo mostly it doesn't go straight up or down, it basically just lay flat. So the, it's more long than, than tall is ideal. And there's really no right side of it. It's just um, either side's gonna be fine. It's because it's a kind of a round oval shape. So um, even if you do put it straight up and down, it'll still flow, it'll still germinate well. They're pretty sturdy, pretty hardy. Um, they just need to make sure you get enough water to them um, while they're germinating. Um, they can start to germinate within a few days, especially if it's warm. Um, I know someone mentioned that they were worried about predators like birds coming to eat them. And we've even in our commercial business, we we spray the seeds often with uh, pepper spray or even with like a chemical thyram, but the birds can still get around that because once they crack the shell, the, the poison is, is not there. So what they've done a lot of in the commercial side is often people will throw cracked corn down on top of the bed and that will kind of distract the birds and they think they've gotten what they need. So they ignore, they ignore the sunflower seeds in the ground and go for the cracked corn. So that's one strategy you could use. Wow, that's really interesting. I did not know that. That's a good, that's a good <laughs> way of, of dealing with that. I always typically do the, um, Steak, so I just grab sticks or bamboo steaks from the garden and then I'll cover it up with, you know, netting or, or chicken wire. I have a lot of chicken wire at home, so that's typically what I use. But the cracked corn seems like an easier method, maybe. That does sound easier. Yeah. Um, so I've tried two different things. This year I'm finally successful. Um, but I have some of that plastic craft mesh, you know, that comes on a roll. So I would plant my row and then put that over it until the plants germinated enough um, and then pulled that off. Um, but this year I tried something totally different. I'm almost embarrassed to say that I tried this, but it worked. Um, and I know that there's a tap root. And so I wanted to ask about that. Um, but they say that sunflowers typically don't transplant very well, but I went ahead and started them indoors in, you know, like five, six inch toilet paper rolls. So I just packed them with soil, put the seed in the top, waited until they were, I don't know, maybe three inches tall. And I took them outdoors. It was great. I got sunflowers this year for the first time in many, many years, because I kind mm -hmm. of outsmarted the critters, I guess. <laughs> but, That's awesome. Yes. And you direct planted them? Because yes. you can biodegrade in the soil. That's yes. super smart. So used up all my toilet paper rolls. <laughs> um, yeah, so, but um, can you talk about that taproot? And typically it's not recommended that you transplant like I just did. <laughs> yeah, so the taproot is, um, you know, a, a carrot, you know, think of a carrot, right? So it's a thick root that grows straight into the ground. Um, it does a really awesome job of absorbing water and minerals deep down. It also anchors the sunflowers in the ground. So, you know, strong wind and they're pretty well rooted in. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, plants that have a taproot prefer to be direct sown outside and not transplanted. But it's a great point that you can grow them inside. Um, and if you can plant it, you know, use toilet paper rolls. I actually think that's pretty genius or use a core pot and cut out the bottom one time and then you don't have to disturb them. Um, but that taproot allows the sunflowers to be really super drought tolerant. So they're really good at finding water on their own. They don't need a lot of supplemental water in the garden. Um, and it makes them really hardy and good, um, low maintenance, easy care plants. The other thing you can do too is some people, there's something called row cover you can buy, primarily sold for vegetables. Because once the sunflowers come up and get a few leaves, the deer no longer like them as much. They're not as tender. So a row cover, it's kind of like some people call it reme. It's like a fiber mesh that you can cover the row with. And uh, that, that's also another option. Good, 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 good. Um, what about um, pests or diseases? Um, you know, talk about it from different points around the country and um, what might be some common ones that uh, are attracted by sunflowers or hit sunflowers and how would you treat them? So um, sunflowers are really pretty, really easy. You know, they're a great beginner plant. They're easy to germinate, easy to grow, and they don't have a lot of pest issues. Um, 
but they can have fungal problems with overwatering or overcrowding. So Bob had mentioned the planting. Um, so be careful and pay attention to the spacing requirements that's on the back of your seed tag. Um, because if you overcrowd them, they can get fungal issues. Um, you know, you get those brown spots on the leaves or the leaves turn yellow, brown and kind of fall off. That's a telltale sign. It's actually not a big deal. They'll grow through it and continue to flower, but it can happen and it can be unsightly. Um, you know, they can get rust, verticillium wilt, powdery mildew, things like that, but it's pretty low, may, low key as far as I'm concerned. Bob may have different um, experiences, but I've never seen major disease issues in the sunflower crops. Um, some pests like to nibble on the foliage, of course, grasshoppers, caterpillars, things like that, <laughs> um, but mainly superficial wounds on the leaves. Right, yeah, in the commercial side, primarily it's I think if the soil is well drained and it's not, there's no standing water, you're not going to get as many issues with root rot or a stem rot. Sometimes we'll see sclerotinia in the stem. You get like a, a brown stripe with the, where the cambium or the xylem is all infected. That, that's often due to just standing water. Um, and the big issue, of course, is there's downy mildew, which tends to get more to the commercial varieties for cup flowers. And that's usually only affects the plant in the early stages. And you'll see just underneath the, the leaf, it's just all white um, underneath the leaf. And now we're now, we're now uh, breeding downy, downy mildew resistant types for the commercial side, but that's more intensive. You know, you have, you have the closer spacing and um, more high intense agriculture. So I think for the homeowner, they probably don't see that hardly at all. But again, I think it's they, they're native to Kansas, you know, where it's it's very dry and sunny and not a lot of humidity. So as you get into more humidity and more moisture, you're, you're going to have more issues. And that's also one of the things that makes them, I think, sort of perfect solution plants is that ability to withstand drought. And you know, um, if you have a really tough spot in the garden that has a hard time staying wet. Um, and it's kind of rocky or dry or maybe even sloped, all those kind of hard areas that are hard to fill, sunflowers are perfect for that. Yeah, like Bob had mentioned, if you have a soggy spot, probably not the right spot for the sunflower. That's the one way you can kind of ruin it for yourself. Um, other than that, there's not a lot to, to, to worry about with the crop. So yeah, you both mentioned sunny, drier spots. Um, what would be the minimum amount of sun needed per day? It's considered full sun, so interpret that for us. So full sun to me is about six hours, six to eight hours, I would say you'd be safe with the sunflower. Um, they definitely prefer as much sun as you can give them. They're very heat and drought tolerant, which makes them awesome summer plants. Um, they can kind of just sail through the heat and humidity. So full sun, six to eight hours at least, um, and you'll be good to go. They'll be really happy. Um, yeah. What about, oh, sorry, Bob, go ahead. I was saying yeah, less than that, they may just be a little more soft and not as much flower or power. Okay, so I'll admit it. The ones that I started in the toilet papers didn't go in um, a perfectly sunny spot. And you're absolutely right. The stems were a little weak. The flowers were a little wimpy compared to just down the row where they were sunnier and they turned out beautiful. So lesson learned. I knew it. I was just trying to pu push mother nature around and she, that never works. Um, what about fertilizers? Do you recommend fertilization? Well, for the commercial side, we recommend you feed from sowing till first bud. When you see the first bud, then you stop fertilizing. And there are growers that they don't need a lot of fertilizer in our, in our experience. Um, so just enough to kind of get them started. And uh, once they're established, they pretty much can go without fertilizer. And would you suggest um, like a water soluble just in your weekly watering? Is that kind of fertilizer you might suggest for the homeowner? Sure, like a miracle grow, um, but maybe I'd go at a half, a third the rate. I think they want a tablespoon per gallon. I'd put a teaspoon per gallon because that's really too strong for a sunfall. You'll get a really lush green growth and the deer will like them because it'll be really soft and tender. Now for, you know, maybe for the uh, 
the ones from Monrovia, the Sun Believables, I believe if they're going all season, they may need more fertilizers. I'm talking more about commercial production where you have just one harvest and then you replant. So but if you're doing more, you know, throughout the summer, they may require more yeah. continuous fertilizer. <laughs> They really, you know, the Sun Believable really doesn't. They're just like, um, they're not heavy feeders. They're sunflower and they just are really easy. Actually, the the one of the common things that we see with Sun Believable is overwatering and overfeeding. The, the foliage gets really healthy, super healthy and cabbage-like. Um, and the flowers kind of they they produce flowers, but not nearly as many. So if you can stress them a little bit you know, that's what makes sunflowers so awesome. You can stress them about an inch of water or two inches of water a week and that's it. Um, and no real need to fertilize and they'll keep producing and, and put all that energy into blooms and not making big, nice cabbage like foliage. Cabbage sunflowers, okay. Um, yeah, Kay had asked the question about the time that you were starting to answer, Georgia, about um, is Bob's fertilizing instructions, did they apply to the compact annual varieties that bloom all season? So I, I'm pretty sure we answered Kay's question. Um, I'm gonna circle back because somebody asked about Tithonia, the Mexican sunflowers. Would you guys say that there's anything special to growing them as compared to the types of sunflowers that we've been discussing? I think they like similar conditions, yeah. High, you know, temp high temperatures are fine. Uh, full sun, don't need a lot of fertilizer or moisture. Um, yeah, typical from Mexico, which as you can re imagine, is kind of similar to uh, Kansas, kind of sunny, dry, and... Uh, Yeah, excellent. Um, so when we were talking about planting too, somebody had asked about um, soil pH and Bob had answered that. I don't know if everybody saw that in the chat, but the optimum pH is 6.0 to 7.2, um, but it also depends on where the type of sunflower you're planting and the native range of that particular sunflower. So I don't know if anybody wants to add anything else on that about the soil pH. Got Not really one? anything that you have to worry about. Sunflowers are pretty easy as far as I've, as far as I've seen, unless you have something really off, but. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, what about on growing sunflowers for, for cutting? Um, would you do anything different as far as fertilization, planting depth, anything like that? It, it, is it different to grow the ones for cuts versus the shorter ones or the all season blooming ones? Well, I'll start. Um, Generally, for cuts, you want to maybe space them five to six inches apart because if you had they're too far apart, you're going to get more side branching, and that's going to take away from the main head. You're going to get a smaller uh, cup head on that. Also, you don't want to over fertilize them because you'll get uh, weaker stems, weaker puddles. Um, so, like I say, you, maybe you fertilize from sowing until uh, first visible bud, then you stop. Um, a little higher potassium is also good. Um, uh, some people will spray the, the, the flowers with potassium nitrate, the stems, to kind of improve the flower head and the quality. Uh, or else you can just use a high potassium fertilizer maybe for your last fertilization. But primarily, yeah, I think it's just more spacing is critical. And then you need to get good spacing between rows if like you're gonna do a, a, several rows. You want at least 18 inches, preferably 24 inches between rows, so you have good air movement between there to keep the disease pressure down. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, for a rule of thumb that I've always heard um, and, and seen myself is, you know, obviously variety makes different, so, you know, each variety has, has a size flower that it's going to produce. So a mammoth is always going to be a big one. Some believable is always going to be sort of smaller. Um, but the closer that you space plants, the smaller the flowers generally, and the further apart, the bigger the flower. So, you know, depending on what kind of flower you're looking to grow and cut, that plays into how you want to space that too. Um, Another, you know, the florist types, I would say go for pollenless. Most of the cut flowers that you see at the grocery store or the farmer's market, um, those are pollenless. 
And that's because that pollen can be really messy as I had mentioned earlier um, for your table or they can just fall off and be kind of loose and messy. Um, so, so that's, there's a lot of awesome pollenless, pollenless flowers, you know, they are the smaller type. So sun believable is pollenless and sterile. It makes a great cut flower. Um, but there are also other cutting varieties like the, um, the pro cut series. A lot of people use that series for, for cutting, um, it's best to harvest them when they're sort of, uh, just starting to unfurl. So this is the head and maybe my fingers are the petals just when they're starting to open. It for, for maximum vase life. So that way you can watch them open and it extends that for, for several days. Excellent. You, you uh, read my mind. That was the next thing I was going to ask is how do you know when, when to cut them and bring them indoors? So that's good. Um, we have a couple questions about saving seeds or leftover seeds. Um, so let's see here. I think, um, how would you store unused seeds for the next year? And Bob had answered that it was best to store in a paper envelope, keep in a refrigerator at 38 to 40. And then somebody said, we'll see carryover, you know, from last year to this year. So how long do you think uh, sunflower seeds are viable if stored in a refrigerator in a paper bag? Um, I would say at least a year, um, you know, possibly two, but uh, if, they're, if they're stored properly and not got, gotten moisture damage, um, like I say, do a pre-test, you know, take, take about 10 seeds and put them in a little, little tray and see how many germinate. And then if you get 80% then, or 70%, you know, how many extra you have to sow or just double sow and thin, that's another way you can do it too. Yeah, good yeah. tips. So when you say put them in a tray, are you meaning like uh, putting them on wet paper towels in a tray? I like, a little, like a little cell pack or, you know, a little, even like an old milk carton cut in half and just, you know, just to kind of see how they. So an actual soil store. germination test then. Right. Okay. Okay, good. Um, yeah, I, we recommend that with, with any old seeds, um, you'd be surprised how long it's just that the germination rate goes down. So you might have to double or triple. So, so that's good. Um, okay. Now here's a question about large headed sunflowers. We've had trouble with our large headed sunflowers with wind that will bend or knock them over any tick tricks to make the stem stronger or keep them up. Do you ever recommend staking sunflowers? You can stake them. Yes, yeah, so if you're having issues with them falling, um, staking them is a really simple way to keep them standing upright. Um, what I do when I stake anything, um, I don't normally have to stake my sunflowers, but I think it depends on where you're at and your wind. Um, I'm originally from the Midwest, so we get a lot, much more intense winds there than we do here where I'm at in Oregon now. Um, but I typically would use, you know, a bamboo stake and just pound it into the ground and then loosely make sure it's loose so that your stem has ability to expand, but then loosely just tie um, the, the, stem, the stem to the stake um, and that should do it. That should help um, keep those upright. Or you can always plant them closer together, but then you run into some of those mildew issues that we were talking about earlier, so. Or the smaller flower heads. Or the smaller flower heads. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, somebody had asked about how many days normally to germination, which I know it varies by variety and it also varies on the age of the seed. So let's just assume you have some fresh seed about how many days to germination? I think it's about five to, five, uh, to seven days, so. Okay. Oh, there you you answered it for her. Okay, and then bottom heat. So so that's assuming. Um, are you recommending bottom heat for that first germination test, or are you saying use bottom heat? Go ahead and start them indoors and then transplant. Either way, yeah, I think the bottom heat's always going to give you a better stand of uh, seedlings. Um, it's not critical, but um, just going to take less time. Yeah. Yeah. And another trick, you know, if you do want to start them inside, it's a good way to get an early start. So you want to typically wait to sow outside until the threat of frost is gone. Um, and that can vary by region, of course. 
But um, starting them inside gives you that head start. And something that I've had luck with starting and then um, putting them out, even when it's sort of like, you know, you're itching to garden and put stuff in and you maybe have one frost coming um, and you can do that. I found that um, in some instances that half milk jug carton of plastic, you can cover your seedlings that way, create sort of a greenhouse effect um, in there to keep them warm. And then granted that your soil is, is warm enough, um, you should be fine with that as well. A mini greenhouse outdoors in your garden. That's always good. <laughs> yeah. um, let's see here. I wanted to ask, um, this, this is a question we get on every single one of these webinars. It doesn't matter which crop we're talking about. And so I would like for you guys to just address the whole issue. Are there any sunflowers that are GMOs, which I'm pretty sure would mean, are they genetically engineered? But um, can you guys answer that? I'm not aware of any that that we sell. Um, I don't think there are any pretty much on the market because yeah. it's not an edible crop. Maybe that maybe in the maybe in the seed oil industry there may be in the seed yeah. this you know in the oil seed uh, side. I'm not aware of anything on the on the ornamental side. I did a little research because um, I saw this question on our list. And I did a little research, and um, I, it doesn't appear that there are any GMOs. Um, you know because that oil goes to Europe and European laws are different. Um, and they all, they, um, there is no GMO in the sunflowers right now, which is. And even if there were, it would probably be for like Bob said, the commercial oil usage, but even you did your research. So we can, we can yeah. pretty definitively say no GMOs in yeah. sunflowers. So that's, yeah, that's good. Um, we were talking about the toxicity earlier and um, somebody had asked specifically, you know, we've got the three sisters garden. And somebody said they heard about a four sisters where you would add a sunflower in with the corn. Now, will that create a problem for the other plants in a three sisters garden? So it's uh, corn, squash, and beans. Would, would that not be a good idea to add a fourth sister to that mix? You know, I've heard, I do know, I actually am not sure about beans. That would be something to look up whether or not beans are sensitive to the sunflower, but I do know that squash can be good companions. They're not quite as um, affected by the toxicity, um, but maybe Bob, maybe you know if the beans would, would be sensitive, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, I'm not uh, so sure about that. I know that my understanding is that the toxicity is more in the seed husk so I think once it germinates, I don't know if the, I don't think the sunflower is necessarily putting out toxins into the soil. Um, I guess I'd have to do a little more research. I'm not as familiar with that side of the the equation. Okay, yeah. we can we can do a little research and include that in the email that we're going to send out as a follow up to see what that one yeah. is. I mean, anecdotally, I have seen many beautiful vegetable gardens with towering sunflowers all around that have been prolific. Um, that is just my personal experience. I don't know if that was just fluke or maybe there was something that was going on. You know, so it would be worth the research. But um, I've seen some some really beautiful, and I'm sure there was corn and beans in that garden as well. But it's usually under the bird feeder, you know, it's like, like Bob was saying, it's the husk. So it's where they fall down under the bird feeder. It's like, well, nothing will grow in that little spot right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So do you know, um, so I might be asking some, some tough questions. Um, you know, if you clean up those husks, like once a week or once a month, will something grow down there or pretty much it doesn't take long for that to get into the soil under your bird feeder? So uh -huh. Oh, go ahead, Bob. I was imagining it has to, have to decay first in order to get into the soil. So, And I've also heard that the toxicity, um, it goes away easily with the, it decomposes quickly. And so, you know, if you take out your sunflower, it'll decompose before the following spring, the toxins, with the rain, it'll kind of wash it away. And so my inclination, my just my hunch is that if you pick them up diligently, that you would get enough rain, enough decomposition to kind of flush that out. Um, you might still see some dying, but that's just my, um, my guess is that it might help. So um, what about some favorite uh, 
planting or design ideas for sunflowers. And I'm going to share one, one with you guys. Um, we have an AAS winner, which I didn't announce that in the beginning, but um, we run both All America Selections and National Garden Bureau out of this office. And so we had a potted sunflower that was a winner a couple of years ago. It's, um, I'm going to blank on the name right now. It'll come to me. But anyway, I was hosting a bridal shower and her theme was navy blue with sunflowers. And so I, early enough in the year, I got these cute little decorative pots and I planted all these sunflowers and then very diligently took them out every day. I'm up here in Chicago. So in April, it wasn't quite warm enough, but I was trying to get them warm. And then that was my centerpiece for the bridal shower. So that was one of the fun ways that we used our Suntastic, that's what it was, Suntastic uh, potted sunflower. So do you guys have any other uh, cool planting or design ideas with sunflowers, how to use them? Well, one of my favorite ways, um, especially with the new breeding now that's coming out, you know, I meant, you know, that flower for a long period of time. So the Sun Believable, for example, I use that in place of mums now in the fall, which is awesome. So um, because they flower all the way to the first hard frost um, and they have that deep, so the Sun Believable, the, the brown eyed girl is the beautiful butter yellow flower. And then on the inside, you have that deep brown sort of eye on the petals themselves. And um, as the temperatures cool, that brown gets deeper and becomes more fall-esque. Um, and so that's been my favorite the past couple of years using that in my fall decor has been really special and it's given me a little bit of um, something a little more interesting than just the mum in the container. Um, I, I've really enjoyed that as part of my decorating. Right, I um, was down at Proven Winners in Carleton, Michigan last week and uh, of course, they had some. They have a sunflower also, but it just was nice to see how they use them to brighten up. You know, they just they had you know all their different varieties with blues and kind of a lot of bronzes, and then all of a sudden a sunflower just kind of just makes the whole area pop nicely. So I think they're really kind of like lights in the garden that just um, brighten up a shady corner or a little transition between plants and bring it all together. So it's just. It's like a bit of sunshine on a cloudy day. So anywhere yeah, you want to put them, I think it's not going to be a bad, bad place. So. Yeah, exactly. Um, when, when we were coming into 2021 and we were talking about how this was the year of the sunflower and we were like, wow, after coming off the COVID year of 2020, it's like, what is more perfect than having a bright, beautiful, smiley sunflower being our annual of the year crop this year with sunflowers. So again, that's why we did the video contest too, because we we're like, okay, maybe everybody will want to show us their sunflowers and everything like that too. Yeah. Um, somebody had asked, um, do you know where to get free donated seeds? Um, well, unfortunately, Roberta, this year, talking about COVID, um, there's it's a little bit harder to get donated seeds. I know a lot of the mail order seed companies, um, like we have them listed on the NGB website under Shop Our Members. I know a lot of them have donation programs, but they also said their donations were cut back to about 10% of normal um, in this year, just because there was such a high demand for seed. But I would just keep my eyes and ears open. Um, especially for the NGB social media things because um, and the All-America selection, sometimes we do some seed giveaways. Um, so yeah, just keep your eyes open. Uh, there's no one good place to tell you where to go. And it kind of depends on, you know, if you have like a therapeutic garden or a children's garden that usually allows uh, for some donations for charitable causes like that. So um, let's see here. So is there anything oh I know I had another question um I somebody I think Georgia you were talking about the colors of the sunflowers so um what about some of the new breeding that people are working on I mean you know the tr traditional is the yellow with the brown center I know those yellow with more of a black center there's a golden yellow there's an orangish yellow there's um ones like ring of fire that has bicolored petals. Um, can you guys talk about anything that the breeders might be working on from a color standpoint of what we might see coming down the pike? 
Hmm. I mean, I'm just as curious as you guys are. I would love to see some really awesome. Um, you know, I love Moulin Rouge is a great, like pure red with that sunny yellow border. I would love to see something like that in a sun believable, you know, mounding branched habit. And that may exist and I just don't know it, but, um, yeah, I think that there's a lot to be said. And I think a lot of people, you know, with this being the year of the sunflower, there's just a ton of interest. And there are so many new gardeners looking for something to grow. And sunflowers are easy and they're cheerful. And um, they're just a really good introduction to gardening. So I have a feeling that we're going to be seeing some really awesome, long blooming plants. Um, I think a big part, a big key for breeding now is the lack of deadheading needed. So that's awesome. Low maintenance in every way. Um, so I think that there's going to be great colors, longer bloom periods, more compact habits as people get smaller spaces to fill. Um, and even the frilly ones like the teddy bears and things on smaller sizes. Yeah. Yeah. The teddy bears are good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think on the cut flower side, I think the new the new trend is having a white sunflower now. Uh, the pro cut now introduced a white uh, sunflower with a black center. That's very dramatic. And they're also, I think, they're using those also for dyeing. They, you know, they can dye them all different colors and stuff. So I think that's another trend for holidays. Um, I think also deeper orange maybe and more true reds. So yeah, they're trying to expand it. But I guess there's still always that traditional, like the poinsettia. People want the red poinsettias, and people always are going to want that yellow sunflower. So, yeah, this is true. Somebody just mentioned in chat that the lime green sunshine flower. So, a, wow. a green sunflower, yet yet another. So it sounds like we're going to pretty soon have a whole rainbow of colors on on sunflowers, which is awesome. I know we've got one in um, the AAS trial this year, have no idea if it will uh, perform well enough to become an AAS winner, but it does have the traditional tall, long stalk, but then there's almost like a whole bunch of flowers at the top. And so yeah. we'll, we'll see how that one does in the trials and we'll know by this fall. Um, Oh, here's another good question. Any varieties or types of sunflowers that you would suggest for making dried flowers? Dried flowers or dried um, for, for seeds or for the dried flower oh. heads? For the flower heads, yeah. Oh, that's a great question. Bob may have some more. I, I know about the seeds, but not quite the dried flowers. Yeah, the... Um... Yeah, because the petals don't really hold up that well, they kind of wilt. People maybe are just saving more than, you know, for the, we call it the disc, the center. They're using those somewhat for like arrangements, ornamental arrangements. And I guess the, you know, you also can get desiccated heads. They, they look okay in a certain sense maybe, but it would have to be more of a dried arrangement. And um, now I think more it's more the disc. I think that's the most ornamental of it than the than the than the puddles. Do you think that you could use the the larger with the larger seeds for eating would be the best ones to use for dried as well? I suppose it depends on the arrangement and how big you want it. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, I, it's not something I see quite a lot of. I think, like you say, the people hang them and dry them for the seeds primarily to keep the birds away once they are ready. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like it would be a challenge to dry. Andrew, shake your head yes or no. Have you tried um, the drying the petals and they didn't work? Oh, you haven't tried it, okay. <laughs> it sounds like it would be a challenge, not, not the maybe one of the best dried flowers that are out there. Um, well, let's see here. Does anybody else have any other questions? Yeah, Gail, <laughs> Gail's daughter has a dried flower business. I was hoping she would chime in. Um, and they have tried it. The leaves curl up and just look pretty sickly. So if you really want to dry flowers, maybe try something other than sunflowers. Hydrangeas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Totally different look, but okay. Uh, yeah, well, panelists, Georgia, Bob, do you have anything else, any other final thoughts and comments about growing sunflowers, what's coming down the pike, or anything else like that? Not 
really just enjoy yourself. It's a fun, it's a fun flower. There are many types and just, you know, try it. Just try it if you haven't, it's really fun. It's great to watch. Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of different um, kind of like meadow seed companies like uh, Outdoor um, Pride. They're, they sell a lot of the, the more wild branching types. I think if you have like a meadows or open land near you, it'd be fun to kind of just plant a lot of sunflowers there and, and make it a natural natural habitat for birds and stuff. And instead of having the bird feeder, maybe have your natural bird feeders. And uh, so I don't, you know, I always need the large types. You can get a lot of variety now in the, in the business and in the genetics. Absolutely. Yeah. Good point. So, so just try it, go plant some sunflowers, have some fun and should all be uh, very sunny and pretty. Uh oh, somebody just said glycerin with water for cut flowers. What about using glycerin with water for cut flowers? I guess that's to make them last longer. Is that the question? Um, I haven't used glycerin, but they do, yeah, cold, clean water and any sort of floral. Um, I always just use the, I cheat. It could be glycerin in there, <laughs> but I always use the packets um, and they tend to tend to hold up well, especially if you harvest them at that young age when they're just starting to unfurl. So always use a preservative of some sort. Get a, get a little extra vase life out of them. Yeah. Okay. Well, we've got our hour coming up. So thank you to our panelists. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Georgia. Thank you to um, all the attendees. This is really good. And like I said, I'll send out a follow-up email with uh, several links and a link to this video. And with that, I think we'll call it a day and have a great week, everybody.